Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How's everyone tonight? <laughs> Good. Uh, my name is Mark Razzi. I'm from the Public Services Office, and I uh, just wanted to take a second to thank you all for joining us tonight. Following in the footsteps of the remarkable Topex Poseidon and Jason 1 spacecrafts, the Ocean Surface Topography Mission has the responsibility of continuing one of the most important ongoing chronicles of Earth's changing climate, the detailed measurement of global sea level. The spacecraft will use a JPL-built advanced microwave radiometer with state-of-the-art integrated circuit technologies along with a new, larger antenna design. These improvements have reduced its mass and power requirements and yet will provide better resolution, improved performance, and reliability. Tonight's speaker received a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of Pittsburgh in 1989 and then earned a Master's degree in Computer Science from Azusa Pacific University in 2001. He has held technical and management positions for JPL's satellite altimetry missions since 1989, including Topex Poseidon, Jason 1, and the Ocean Surface Topography Mission, of which he is currently project manager. He has 20 years of professional experience as a flight and ground system software engineer and spacecraft systems engineer, and has held various project element management positions throughout his career. He is also a recipient of the National NASA Exceptional Achievement Medal and the NASA Public Service Medal for his technical and leadership contributions to the Topex Poseidon and Jason missions. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming tonight's guest, Mr. Parag Vizay. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as Mark uh, kindly introduced me, uh, I'm Parag Vaze, uh, the project manager for the Ocean Surface Topography Mission. And tonight, I uh, hope to give you a, a very quick primer on and a summary on the Ocean Surface Topography Mission. I've titled this talk, the uh, Keeping an Eye on the Earth's Changing Climate, the Ocean Surface Topography Mission, also known as Jason 2. Uh, there is uh, obviously another mission called Jason 1 already going. So let me go ahead and get started. Um, so whenever I do these, I kind of think to myself, um, trying to answer some questions. Why, why are you guys all here uh, at 7 o'clock in the evening? So um, one of the things uh, people ask me all the time is, uh, what is ocean surface topography? What, is, what does it have to do with climate, climate change? Why do we need it? Um, you know, we're spending money. Why do we need it? Uh, what makes up this mission? Uh, how does it work? Uh, how do we build it? And uh, how's it working now? We did launch this satellite back in uh, uh, 20th of June this year. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then what about the future? So why do we care? Um, you know that uh, the ocean is a big part of the planet. Um, the ocean affects the climate through uh, its huge capacity to, uh, uh, with water, uh, and heat. Uh, it, the oceans themselves have 97% of all the water on the earth. And what even I didn't realize uh, until I got started here is that only up, only three meters of the ocean uh, stores the, the same amount of heat as the atmosphere. We, we talk about the atmosphere, we think about, study the atmosphere a lot. Um, global warming, uh, we talk about, well, a lot of that heat is stored, most of that heat is, is stored in the ocean. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit less, more on the next chart, about 84% as, as this chart uh, outlines. So where is the heat coming from? It's coming from the sun. Um, we get most of that heat coming in. Some of it gets reflected out. And we have some net heat that, that's stored on the earth and uh, absorbed. And as you can see from this chart, most of it, 84% roughly, uh, stays in the ocean. It's maintained in the ocean. The atmosphere, the continents, and ice are, are a very small percentage, uh, relatively. So people have been looking at studying the oceans and monitoring sea level, sea level changes, sea level rise, um, sea ocean currents. Uh, they've been trying to measure this for a long time. Uh, since the 1800s, people have been charting the, the oceans uh, all around the world, taking measurements. But you can kind of see the ocean's a big place. Can't really take really good, precise, accurate measurements in a timely manner. Um, and people have been trying for lots of, uh, uh, of different ways of trying to do it, buoys, um, ships, all kinds of things. But um, the oceanographers really started looking at alternative methods to start looking and, and being able to measure the oceans 
much, much more accurately and, and precisely. Um, and, and to try to do it in a, in a quick manner so that we can actually use that data um, and process that data uh, in, our, in our forecasting models that we have. So this is a picture of uh, San Marco Square in Venice, Italy. Um, this was not ha because of sea level rise. It was just to draw your attention probably. Um, but it's not a particularly pleasant day in, in that piazza there. Um, it was just a day after a storm. Um, personally, I've been there just on a day after this, and it's not, not very pleasant walking around trying to tour things. But um, sea level is, is rising. It's rising slowly over a long period of time. And uh, so everybody's obviously concerned at, at trying to understanding, understand how it's changing, how quickly it's changing. So the, the question people first look at is, OK, well, how fast is sea level rising and changing? And, and, and this, kind, this chart kind of illustrates that um, it is rising, uh, rising slowly, but it's hard to forecast and, and trend how, how quickly it's rising. And it, and it changes over time. Uh, you can see from this kind of red arrow here where tide gauges uh, were used and forecasted out. And then there was a prediction with multiple models that were done. And, and there's a pretty widespread on, on how that changes. And with satellite observations, it's, it's on the upper edge and it's changing. So we, we need to monitor this, and we need to monitor it accurately, and we need to monitor it over a, a long period of time um, so um, we can get better measurements and forecasts. This is another uh, uh, chart that kind of uh, shows some panels of rising sea levels. Uh, the first top panel is a chart of uh, Florida uh, getting uh, various levels of water and ocean inundation. You can see present in the middle is, is one meter rise and six meter rise. That's a, that's a lot, but even small changes you can see starts affecting uh, big piece, pieces of, of uh, real estate there. So maybe in the long run, people have some beachfront property, but right now uh, I think people are concerned about not and, and saving and protecting those assets. And, and most of the populations also resides along these, these coastal communities. So. Um, you know, that's why we spend so much resources in trying to uh, uh, protect our assets, warn, have an early warning for all of the populations that we have. Um, here's another on the bottom panel, uh, a similar type of, of study for Louisiana. Uh, you've heard about Katrina and all of its effects, and, and uh, that was a, a one-time event, but this is a, a, a global sea level rise and what it would do in terms of, uh, of inundation. So the question is, um, how do we measure this uh, with satellite altimetry? And the technique that was developed uh, is called, uh, called satellite altimetry. Um, it was tried out and tested on, on various missions uh, right from the 70s, but really as a precise measurement uh, for this purpose, it really started out with the Topex Poseidon mission. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but how, do, how does satellite altimetry work? And I showed you earlier that you know, we want to have good, precise measurements. So we have a, an instrument called a radar altimeter on the satellite. And it's measuring things just like a radar that you've heard and seen and probably used maybe in your cars and stuff now, um, which is bouncing in a radio frequency signal off from the satellite down to the ocean surface, bouncing back up. We measure how fast it returns, and that gives us the distance, basically. So once we, we know that, um, let me see if this this works. So once we know this range, um, to really figure out how, what this range actually is, we need to know what the satellite's position is. Um, I kind of think this technique just like a surveyor on the ground where you're standing there, you're measuring something maybe with line of sight, maybe now with a laser. You need to know where you are, and they use GPSs now. But uh, we use the same kind of technique. Um, we use a GPS on the satellites itself, and there's a couple of different kinds of instruments. Um, also one called DORIS, which is kind of a reverse GPS, we call it, using a beacon system. So there's kind of two techniques. One is knowing how far the ocean is um, and, and trying to correct for it. There are some atmospheric effects that we need to correct for, and that's why we need another instrument called a radiometer. And then we have three other instruments um, for positioning the satellite. And that's basically the technique that, that's been used since um, uh, for, the, for the past 20 years. 
So besides knowing and being able to measure it, um, one of the key uh, decisions in, in developing a mission is knowing the orbit. And to do that, the objective here is to cover as much of the ocean as we can, um, cover it relatively fast, and uh, not have too many gaps. Um, this was picked with lots of, in fact, years of studies on, on various orbits and so forth. But the orbit that's been picked uh, with, for this particular satellite constellation now is uh, 1,300 kilometers uh, with a 66 degree tilt, 66 degree inclination. And it repeats every 10 days. So we basically produce and, and take the same measurements over the same place every 10 days. So the satellite altimetry, as I mentioned, was the concept was proven out and, and shown in, in prior missions and, and mission uh, uh, developments uh, from CSAT and, and various other platforms. But Topex Poseidon was the first where we were really measuring. Uh, the objective was to measure the sea surface height very precisely. Uh, our budget at that time was about 12 centimeters, which sounded really, really tough for us. At this altitude, this range, et cetera, et cetera. 12 centimeter accuracy sounded pretty tough. Turned out, we worked, developed this mission, built the hardware, flew the satellite, and also developed the ground processing and calibration techniques, and we were able to get the measurement down to somewhere around four to six centimeters. And this was a research mission. It was an experiment. That's what TOPEX stands for, uh, topography experiments. And the Poseidon part is, is the equivalent altimeter that was supplied by the French. And I'll, I'll talk about that partnership um, over, uh, over the past 15 years um, between the US and Europe. After that, um, people started believing in this measurement. It can actually do the job. So the question was, OK, now can we continue this measurement? Can we improve it? Um, there was a decision to fly a mission called Jason-1, still flying, um, and with quite a few improvements in terms of the technology that went into developing the satellite, the hardware, the calibration, the processing, et cetera. And now we're actually flying the ocean surface topography mission, as I said, that was just launched um, in June. So for OSTM, um, the objective was, was a little different. Um, but the objective in a series of these missions is to produce a, a long-term global data record. Uh, as I showed you on some of those prior charts, uh, the sea level is, is changing, but it changes um, uh, slowly, and it has to be measured accurately. So if you have gaps, and, and you really don't know what's happening between. Our models aren't really good enough just to kind of draw a straight line through it. What we find is we really need an accurate long-term measurement that goes on. So with OSTM, um, as I said, with Topex, we kind of started out as research. With Jason, we, we showed that we could continue that measurement. With OSTM, uh, the objective was a little different, where we not only wanted to continue that measurement, but we wanted to start being used, use this data and this measurement and the techniques in an operational way. Um, so we, we started looking at uh, not only uh, ways of improving our hardware, but a little bit adding some additional objectives, like getting better coastal resolution. I, I showed you some of the other pictures with Florida and so forth, um, where we now understood how to measure sea surface height in the global oceans. And now we want to be able to get closer to the coast, because that's where the action is, really, right now with, with immediate impacts to people. Um, so we, we've started developing some techniques to have a look and, and a better focus on on coastal uh, measurements and applications. So for OSTM, uh, what we're looking for is what we've been calling researched operations. Uh, this is something that NASA and I'm, I'm sure other agencies have been working on for a long time where we're developing new techniques, new hardware, and at some point we want to be able to transition that to operations, to operational use. And for, for this particular uh, space altimetry, um, folks have developed a lot of applications, including in, uh, uh, using this data in, in hurricane models and improving those for future forecasting, for ship routing, for fisheries management, for offshore uh, exploration, for laying things like cables where you need to know what the currents are in the ocean, and they can be quite significant. So this data is right from Jason, Topex to Jason and now to OSTM is actually being used every day 
We have a lot of users globally that are using this data uh, in various applications. So for OSTM, um, the idea was to try to make this, as I said, research to operations. How do we do it? We improved some of our hardware and our techniques, but we also decided to form uh, a different, an additional partnership, a different partnership. So before, we always had this partnership with France. Um, you can see on the upper right, which is um, called CNES, which is the, the French Space Agency, sort of the equivalent of NASA for France. Um, and NASA, those were the two primary partners that had been developing the, the missions together and funding them. Um, and then now, in terms of trying to get this over towards operations, the idea was to get the operational agencies. In the U.S., it's NOAA, uh, which is the National Oceani Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, folks that are flying and producing the satellite weather satellite images you see probably every day in the paper or on TV and so forth. So they've got about 17 satellites that they're flying to produce all of that, uh, uh, those nice uh, sets of data and, and images. And then equivalently in Europe, uh, there's an agency called UMETSAT, uh, which is sort of a, a combined EU uh, 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 atmospheric uh, agency that's uh, equivalent and partnered with NOAA on this mission. So the way we've got the, the mission split up is, is kind of NOAA and CNES um, work on the development side, and I'll, I'll show you some of those elements later. And then uh, NOAA and UMETSAT are, are working on the operations, which is how we'd like to be able to transition the measurement in the future where the operational agencies are actually using the data, producing products, assimilating it, and knowing how to uh, exploit it in even further, uh, uh, more specific applications for, for the public. So it's a quick chart I've been showing, I think, for seven years now um, on, on the uh, uh, mission summary. Um, our objective from a science perspective, the first thing we do in a mission What's, what's our science objective? So we want to be able to measure the sea surface very accurately, as I said, down to about four centimeters. On JSON, we are measuring it well below this four centimeters. On OSTM, the, the objective is there for four centimeters, um, but we really expect our, our goal is to measure it down to about two centimeters or less, and, and I think we're going to be able to do that. So as I said, continue this long-term data record get more partners from operational agencies to try to make this measurement uh, operational uh, in the future and act as a bridge so that in the future we expect that NOAA and UMETSAT will, will team up in the future and, and fly this kind of measurement and this kinds of missions as, as routine business as, as they do for all of their other uh, measurements that they, uh, uh, that they currently provide. Uh, it was launched on the 20th of June on a Delta II rocket, and I'll show you in uh, lots of several interesting pictures and animations and so forth. The mission life is for three years with a goal of five years. Um, Jason 1 has been flying now past the five years and, and so far still doing good, um, but we're up there and, and now we're starting to do a cross calibration with, with, this, uh, with the existing Jason mission and continuing that data record. The instrument set we're flying, I showed you this picture on the right-hand side before with the measurement concept. But the primary instrument is the Poseidon altimeter. Then we have a, an instrument called the Advanced Microwave Radiometer that was built, developed and built at JPL. Um, those are the two instruments that are really needed for the measurement itself. And then to understand the position of the satellite, we have the GPS payload and um, retro, laser retroreflector array and the DORA system, which I'll, which I'll talk about in a minute. So this is a complicated diagram. I'm not going to go through all of it, but it's just to kind of pictorially show that we have four mission partners on this project, so how things are split up and, the, and then how things are put back together. And so far, um, in, the, in the development cycle, it always takes a little more when you have more partners, more interfaces, more coordination, and um, especially going back and forth to Europe uh, and getting, making sure things are working right and, and translated right. Uh, has been a challenge, but it's worked out quite good uh, since we've had a, a very long-term relationship with, with France, especially on, on these types of missions. So um, on the U.S. side, we're, we're providing the Delta II launch vehicle on the spacecraft. Um, CNES was responsible for providing uh, the main elements for the spacecraft, which we call the spacecraft bus. 
uh, and then the payload, which consists of the instruments, uh, was, uh, was a shared development between uh, NASA, JPL, and, and CNES for the instruments. The Poseidon altimeter here, that's shown here, the advanced microwave radio radiometer, which is this instrument. The GPS uh, antennas, the electronics are inside. So basically, once the satellite's up and running, uh, the data is transmitted both in Europe and in the US. In Europe, it comes down at UMETSAT, transferred over to CNES and processed into data products. Uh, same thing on the U.S. side, we get the data at, at NOAA, which is located in, in Maryland, in Suitland, Maryland, processes products, and then we also uh, uh, continue to talk to NOAA and get data and monitor the instruments here at JPL. So a little bit about uh, the satellite, I kind of showed you the same thing earlier with the advanced microwave radiometer. This is a, a new generation from Jason. Um, Jason was flying a different radiometer. This is a, a new development with a three-frequency radiometer to measure the water vapor content. As the altimeter is running, the signal basically gets delayed and produces an error in the altimeter signal because of water vapor. So we need to correct for that. That's what this instrument does. Um, <coughs> as we've been going along in these missions, um, the mass and power, as, as Mark mentioned in the, in the beginning, is something we've been working on and trying to improve. The satellite from Topex um, to, to Jason to OSTM is kind of what I compare as going from a bus to a really small car. Um, we're, we're kind of a, a, at a small car level now. And it's been a challenging development, interesting because we're continuing the mission, but also improving the technology uh, and research that goes into it. Um, the GPS antenna and the um, uh, electronics, this is something we've also been working on over the generations. And um, many people ask me about GPS, is it the same as my car, or is it just like my, what I use when I go hiking? Yes, it's kind of the same thing, but it's a really, really high performance GPS. Um, we're measuring our satellite's position to about one centimeter as we're flying along in space at seven kilometers per second. So it's a little bit faster than, than your car. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little more challenging, and, uh, but it's working out good. Um, the altimeter, as I mentioned, um, this is also something where Kness has been making improvements on their side. Um, it's kind of the same altimeter we've been flying, but the techniques, uh, as I mentioned, on the coastal side are, are where we've really been improving uh, our, our processing and our, uh, and our measurement technique and our accuracy so we can get much better resolution and much better measurements along the coast. Um, the laser retro, or I'm sorry, the Doris receiver, again, provided by CNES. This is a, a complementary um, uh, device, for, again, for positioning the satellite. And this is a, a unique system which, instead of using GPS satellites and then kind of triangulating the signal knowing where you are, it uses a different system where it has radio beacons on the ground, on the Earth, and essentially has a receiver on the spacecraft which is using those radio signals to triangulate the, the spacecraft's position. And that's also been working, working quite well and uh, is used in, a, in all our data processing. The laser, laser retro reflector array, this is a, a fairly, not a fairly, it is a simple instrument. It's, it's a set of uh, optical cubes that we mount in a very precise manner um, so that we can shoot lasers from the, the ground and get returns and measure the spacecraft's position. It's not something that's used in routine operations really for calibration and validation. We can't really do it all the time. There's spots we collect data and shoot the laser, calibrate the system, but the rest of the time we need to know where we're at, and that's what we use the, the Doris and GPS system for. And then uh, last thing I didn't talk about were three experimental payloads. I'm not going to talk about them because they were experimental payloads. We had space, and Kness uh, had some boxes they wanted to fly, so we're flying. Some, some experiments and, and giving opportunities for, for future flight demonstrations. Uh, okay, so here are some pictures of, of the hardware. Uh, on the top left is the advanced microwave radiometer. Um, this is something that's self-contained. Uh, the other prior missions, we've had them embedded in the spacecraft with lots of, uh, of wiring, harnesses, uh, RF uh, uh, waveguides, et cetera, that are coming all around. The new design here is a lot smaller, lighter, less power, and self-contained. The GPS, which is shown right here, this is what the electronics looks like. 
You saw the antenna before, and this is the laser retroreflector array. Altimeter uh, is a little more than just the antenna. There's, there's a lot of electronics behind it, but I can't show you every single picture. Um, Doris antenna. And then once we get, have the payload, which we talked about, uh, we got to put it on the spacecraft. And there's two pieces to the spacecraft. There's one which is called the payload module. And all of these elements are basically integrated into the shell. I was always amazed that this is a lot of hardware. And this basically looks like a little frame box that you're mounting everything to. And, um, I, believe me, it's pretty strong and, and, and holds all of, these, uh, all of these instruments because one of the things we do as part of the test program is basically shake the whole spacecraft, bake it, go to, go to extreme temperatures, and, and it's withstood all of, those, uh, all of those tests quite well. And then there's the bottom piece, which is what we call the spacecraft bus, which holds all of the uh, electronics actuators for the, the spacecraft itself. So provides all of the electrical supply, the uh, attitude control to keep us pointed correctly, uh, and all of the other data interfaces that we need to, to get the data back down on, on the ground. This is what the satellite looks like when it's all put together. Um, and uh, I'll show you some more interesting pictures in a minute, moment. So as I mentioned, this has been a partnership between France and the US, at least in terms of the, the spacecraft development. So once we developed all the instruments here, we sent them over to France, attached them on, on their spacecraft, tested the heck out of it. And then since we're launching it out of, uh, with, in, with using our rocket here in Vandenberg Air Force Base, not too far from here, we're gonna ship the whole thing back here. Uh, just some of the logistics are always interesting that goes behind that. But here's uh, some pictures of, of the 747 that was used to fly it. And uh, this is the spacecraft container coming back out at Vandenberg Air Force Base. So once we did get it over there, um, we have to go through and basically put it all back together and test it all over again. So this is some picture of, of the final tests that were done uh, at, at Vandenberg Air Force Base. And we had a relatively uh, smooth program uh, where we went through and, and the spacecraft really uh, uh, performed quite well. And then of course the last thing is to Put it, put it and mount it on top of the rocket and then and fly the rocket. And I'm going to show you some more pictures and slides on that. So I talked a lot about the, uh, the flight segment, the space segment. But that's not the only piece that goes along with it. That's one piece. Um, there's also a lot having to do with still taking you know, in situ measurements, um, which there's lots of buoys and all kinds of other measurements, not just sea level, but salinity and, and, and various other measurements that go in to these models. Uh, including our satellite observations. And, and the objective in the long run, of course, is to have better models and better forecasts. Um, so this is something that, that we've also invested uh, a lot of time and efforts on improving uh, our, our ground processing, our, our applications, and, and the turnaround time. So if we're trying to make things more operational, we want to have these products, really good products, and have them turned around really quick. So now we're turning around products on on JSON-1 that were produced in, in a couple of days, we're turning them around on OSTM in, in three hours. So this is a, a generational change and something that's really needed for operational use as opposed to research use. But obviously, we're getting uh, long-term research uh, with the long-term data record that we're building. And we're building a, uh, a global community. I mean, we started out, I think, with pretty much US and, and maybe French users and maybe a few others in Europe. But you can see now, over, over the years, there's, uh, there's users all over the world in all kinds of applications. Uh, so it's a, a truly um, global, international effort. And all our data is, is publicly available. Uh, anybody can go on to uh, the NOAA web server or the CNES web server and download data, download products, uh, and have a look, which is which has been our, our objective to have a, a free and open data policy. So I have some, um, hopefully, some interesting animations. And if I can run them, I will try to do that. So the first one is an animation of the spacecraft, how it looks, how it would operate in space with, as I mentioned, the altimeter bouncing um, radio frequency signals up. Um, there's some shots of, of the laser coming up and then the GPS constellation that we're also getting signals from. 
no, this is not Star Wars with lasers firing all over the place. You don't see them, et cetera. <laughs> so, but um, you know, the objective is, is to get, um, I miss talking about it here as it was coming, but we're kind of building a strip map with all of these measurements. And as, it, as we build this strip map, every 10 days, we, we get a global map out of it. And that's really the, the ultimate objective from a research point of view is, is to try to get a long-term map that we can characterize over years and years, and then obviously operational products that are used. Um, so as I mentioned about the launch, we got the, the spacecraft over here. Um, so the next thing was, um, what does that look like over here? This is a little animation of Vandenberg Air Force Base. Not a particularly, you don't want to go camping, there's, there's not much there. But um, uh, it's a good facility for launching rockets. Um, we have the, using a, a really good uh, rocket called the Delta II that was developed by Boeing, now, now uh, managed by uh, United Launch Alliance. And this is uh, just an animation of, of the launch itself, what happens with the rocket taking off. Um, basically, we launched in the daytime. This was just to show, give the effect of, I'm sorry, we launched in the nighttime. This was just a, a daytime shot of the animation. Um, and then I'll show you a little more on, on reality behind that. So um, talking about the launch itself, um, this is um, some video of, of our launch actually on the 20th of June. And it was really a picture perfect launch, clear day uh, that, that we were able to see the launch for miles and miles and miles. Um, and, and really a beautiful uh, uh, trouble free launch that we had with, uh, with the Delta II. Then um, once that was done, the next question is, getting up and we're all holding our breath, you know, as, as the rocket's taken off. Okay, it's taken off. Next thing is please get us into space and, and make sure we separate from the rocket. And to make us feel good and make sure we, we were able to do that, we had a, something I think relatively interesting, which was a, a, a camera on the actual upper stage of, of the rocket. And this is an actual footage of the spacecraft uh, separating from the, from the launch vehicle and getting deployed. And, I'm not going to run it too long, but one of the objectives here was to actually see the solar panels on both sides deploy. That's another thing. Is, as a project manager, you're holding your breath. Please, now that I'm separated, please let the solar panels deploy and make sure I have some power. And with this video, we were actually able to see the solar panels deploy, which was, which was really amazing uh, for us. And I think, as I said, relatively new. I got a lot of calls and interest from various missions on, you know, what is this camera? Where'd you get it? Et cetera, et cetera. How much does it cost? <laughs> so I think you'll probably see more and more of those kinds of, uh, of clips in the future, which is a really a good thing. Um, let's see. Did I lose my presentation? Okay, let me, I might have to bring it up again. Um, so we talked about that. Um, so how are we doing now? Um, the spacecraft's up, running. Um, actually, we we commissioned the spacecraft, I, I would say, in pretty uh, short duration. Essentially, we started turning on all the instruments on the 21st, the day after uh, we launched. And then by the 26th, we were up and running. Um, after that, we go through a whole sequence of, of orbit, small orbit changes to get them to our final orbit right behind Jason 1. And this, within a, uh, within a month or so, we were producing uh, data and comparing it with Jason 1. And, Again, it's, it's hard for you to see, but you can see from the colors in the two uh, plots here uh, between Jason 1 on the bottom and Jason 2 on, on top, uh, OSTM, and we're, we're already producing products that are essentially equivalent to, to Jason 1. And we're still going through uh, about a six month calibration phase. And uh, of course, we hope to improve on that even further. So um, what about the future? Um, so. As I mentioned to you a little earlier, we have this ground track that we're kind of doing strip maps. And we're doing measurements of using altimetry. And we're understanding the, the global ocean picture pretty well. I wouldn't say pretty well, a lot better than we did. Um, but what, what I think uh, folks in the science community are also starting to see is there's a lot of action in between those ground tracks, a lot of, uh, uh, of, of small scale uh, ocean activity, uh, some of the things called eddies that are, that are going around and creating all kinds of different circulation patterns and so forth. And so now there's a global interest to try to understand what's happening in those 
gaps in between. We're, we're kind of doing strip maps of a couple kilometers, and then there's about a 200 kilometer gap. So what happens in those two, 200 kilometers? And the next generation mission that, that we're working on right now, again, uh, hopefully with, uh, with a partnership between the US, U.S. and France, is something called the Surface Water and Ocean Topography Mission, which is really to, to go and, and a whole generational change on the spacecraft and the payload, which is the main instrument, where we use a, uh, an interferometer instead of a nominal altimeter and then uh, actually measure the sea surface and have global coverage and, and actually much better resolution than we have now. So this is something that's just starting. We're, we're formulating the mission, and we hope this is something in the coming years that uh, will enable this to go to the next level, not only just keeping our, our uh, uh, nominal mission uh, and measurements, but uh, expanding uh, what we know about the oceans uh, much further. So I think that's all I have uh, for my talk. Uh, if you have some questions, I'd be happy to try to address them. Yes? I'm just curious, in the Cascan Sea Basin, why is that sort of a purple color? I have no clue. But I, I'll be happy to find out because I'm not a scientist, but I'll be happy to find out. <laughs> yes? I have a question. You had mentioned things like laying cables along the yes. and yes. collaboration with other projects. Yes. Would um, your instrument um, produce useful data in collaboration with something like Project Neptune, where the whole Juan de Fuca plate actually has already been hardwired, or is being hardwired, with... Um, uh, fiber optic cable to look at the plate tectonics. I mean, the, does this instrument have the resolution? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, but again, I, I, I can put you in touch with the right people to answer that question. But I, I don't believe so. I don't, I don't believe so. Any other questions? Yes? How do you uh, calibrate between JSON 1 and JSON 2? Yeah, good question. Work? Good question. Um, so we have the luxury of having JSON-1 and JSON-2, and we're actually flying right behind each other. Uh, so right now we're flying, basically, JSON-1 is there, and OSTM is flying about 50 seconds behind it on the exact same ground track, the exact same orbit. Essentially, a very similar spacecraft and, and instrument. So the answer is just pretty much by comparison, because we're flying over the same point 55 seconds later. But there's a lot more to it, where we have some ground truths that we have. We have platforms out in the ocean, both in, that, that are supported in the US and, and in Europe, where we actually take truth measurements and, again, overfly those with the satellite and calibrate those. Yeah, yeah follow up? Uh, do you make a bit point map on what you're doing, or do you do, do some sort of equation that shows? That it's equations, it's equation. analysis. Okay. analysis yeah. Thank you. Yes? Uh, is there a way to relate the height of the ocean to its temperature so that you can track things like El Nino? Yes, yes. This is actually the exact, the El Nino forecast or, and, and monitoring and forecasts are a direct product of, of these ocean altimetry missions. So uh, the answer is absolutely yes. How, how does that work? Well, it's kind of um, like, um, and we can spend more time on it later, but <laughs> it's kind of like how atmospheric models are done, where you're looking at uh, atmos atmospheric pressures and trying to derive temperatures as, as water uh, flows in, in different pressure fields. In the ocean, it's kind of the same way. So um, you can, you can uh, infer temperatures, gradients, wind speeds, all kinds of products from, from this measurement. Yes? What's the repeat rate on the measurements? You know, how, how often are you? Every 10 days. Every, every 10 days. But that's how, when you pass over the ocean surface. I was wondering about, you know, as I understand it, the laser shines down and it bounces off the ocean surface and it goes back up. Ah. That happens, you know, really fast. Yes. But then you do it again, right, to measure it again. So it's really fast. It's, it's in the gigahertz range. <laughs> so really so, measure yes, so we're, we're, we're transmitting at, at KU band, so it's, it's really, really fast measurement. And it's really, really uh, essentially continuous as far as, let's say, Normal How is that data transmitted then down? So it's recorded. It's recorded on board. Okay. And then as we come over uh, uh, an earth station, then it's downlinked to the earth station. And then it's processed. So we don't do onboard processing, but we basically collect the data on board, record it, wait for it to come over, wait for the satellite to come over a ground station, and then downlink it. So those measurements are made 
billions of times a second. Yes, they're ma made lots and lots and very, very frequently. <laughs> Much more frequently than I can count probably. But yes, yes, it's essentially con continuous. And, and you can change those, but that frequency is particularly chosen because it's tuned to making this kind of measurement off the, off the ocean surface. So you use different frequencies for various applications. Yes? Does salinity have any appreciable impact on ocean level? You know, I, I, I leave that to the, to the scientists because I, I frankly don't know. But I, I should have warned you that I'm an engineer, not a scientist. But, uh, but uh, again, I'd be happy to, to refer you. Yes? This is kind of a stupid question, possibly. That's, that's, that's for me. Okay. <laughs> Given, you know, the ocean has waves and little surface motion, that, mm -hmm. that, how do you smooth that out to get a real right. estimate so, of... So we don't that. actually measure the topography of the bottom of the ocean, okay? We're actually measuring the sea surface height, but we're also measuring against some reference in what we call a geoid, which is which is a reference that's, that's been created. It's a model which also includes all kinds of other factors like pr primarily gravity, which, which plays into the height of the ocean and the, and the shape of this, this reference. What yes. kind of accuracy do you have between your measurements and the measurements of the ocean buoys as they're moving up? It's down? quite comparable. It's quite comparable. What kind of uh, percentage error? Uh, I don't know the exact number between buoys, but um, I know that um, they're able to do that resolution as, as similar resolutions, but they can't do it very often, and they're out many, many times. So you can't basically spread them all over the ocean and, and continue to get that data. There are projects. There's a project called Argo, which has many, many buoys all across the ocean and, and collects that data. So it's needed. It's definitely needed but it doesn't give you that long-term precise data record that we were looking for. Yes, I'll take one in the back there. Um, when you get a signal back yes. from, from the ocean with, the, with your altimeter, about how large a footprint are you averaging the height over? About three kilometers. Three kilometers. Oh. Yeah, that's why I was saying earlier that we're kind of getting a, a strip map. Of, of several kilometers, and, and we have these large gaps in between the next strip map. When you kind of pull out and you're looking at that ground track, it looks awfully good. But you know, the closer and closer you get down towards the Earth, you start realizing you've got really large gaps in there. Yes? So, so here's an engineering question for you. <laughs> <laughs> you're, not, you're on the project. You're not allowed to ask questions. <laughs> I don't think it's a matter of giving up. Um, we're planning on applying that same technique and technology towards SWAT. Okay, so I think globally for that mission it will help because we've already reduced one component because the new instrument is going to be a tough development and mass and power are going to be very, very precious. So it's going to help offset some of the, the design difficulties and challenges we're going to have on the new instruments. So it'll pay off. The answer is it'll pay off. Yes? Um, you've got a 10-day cycle. Mm -hmm. You're saying, well, a 10-day cycle and it's 200 kilometer gap. Mm -hmm. You're saying the next mission will close the, the spatial gap. Correct. I think my question has to do, what, what's the time scale of things that are changing, both at the scale you're measuring and maybe at the scale of the next one? You know, they're, they're are, are the things small. that are happening at, at your scale really 10-day things, or are there things where you go, uh, you know, that's really a two-day event? No. Just... This, again, was tuned because the features we're looking for are changing relatively slowly. And again, we're looking for a global map. We're not looking for, you know, can I go, uh, you know, out in Long Beach Harbor tomorrow, <laughs> you know? <laughs> what, what, is there a sense that, what will the time scale be like when you are doing, when you're filling in the, 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 the time scale, actually, the, the repeat time may not improve, okay, but the resolution and coverage will significantly improve. Are there significant things, this is a follow-on from this question, that you're actually missing? 
Sure. I think there, uh, there are things that are being missed, and, but there are things that were discovered because we, we, we found this measurement to begin with. So I think it's just a technological and, and science uh, progression. Any other questions? Yes. How are the overall project costs shared? It's about 50-50 between U.S. and Europe. Uh, the rough cost of this mission was uh, about $430 million. And it's roughly 50-50, roughly but I think that's the way it started out. And then as the dollar got weaker, it ended up being more like 60-40 or something. So I don't know what today's conversion rate is, but it was intended to be roughly 50-50. Okay, any other questions? Yes. You said it's a three-hour download time? Uh, no, I didn't say it's a three-hour download time. The actual time, every almost roughly every two hours, we have a, a downlink pass. How, how long then before that, that data is available to the public? Do you, do you have to process it? And we, we try to make that data available after the time it's downlinked down to the ground till a intermediate product is ready within three hours for operational users. It's a, it's a lower quality, obviously, as a longer... Uh, uh, time you go, you use better models, better measurements, and so it gets better and better. Yes, in the back. So you said the first one and the second one is only a few seconds behind for calibration reasons. It's once it's done, uh, wouldn't it be beneficial to put it, uh, I guess, five days apart? So you right. have five day complete scan. So. You're, you're exactly correct. So the plan right now is after the CalVal period is over, um, we'd like to run this kind of tandem. We, we'd like to run in this mode where we're kind of following each other for about six months, uh, do the full calibration and validation. And even when Topex and Jason came online, so Topex was the older satellite, Jason came online, they followed each other, ran it for, for a few months, and then we actually separated them. In, in kind of uh, uh, parallel ground tracks to improve, effectively double the resolution, so which, which I think is what maybe you were implying. So the answer is, yeah, we're, we're planning that as long as JSON-1 is running, which we certainly hope and expect. Uh, uh, which one are you going to move, though? JSON-1. Okay. <laughs> because what's important is being, continuing this measurement is being over the same place in the same orbit. And producing the same kind of ground tracks that we are. Yes? When you mentioned it was a, actually a three kilometer wide swap, and how does that work? Is it, is it like every foot you measure it, every foot? Or it's averaged. Uh, average, but every meter, or how, how does it? Oh, I don't know the, the, the pixel uh, uh, size and, and resolution. I don't know, but I, I, can, I can find out. But yeah, but it's roughly averaged, and, and the resolution within that three kilometers is, is very high in between pixels. Can I ask a follow-on question? Sure. <laughs> About the, will the, the uh, interferometer-based uh, satellite, will that uh, be launched from Vandenberg or will it be much larger? I have, have no clue. I have no clue. Uh, in fact, I mean, we're just in the process of putting together uh, a team to study this project. Uh, so um, what the mission will look like, um, how it'll be configured, what a potential partnership might be, is all things that uh, we don't know the answers to. Yes? One man's noise is another man's data. I, I notice you're, you're measuring the amount of water vapor yes. in the column underneath you. Yes. Is, is there anyone using that? Yes. It, the answer okay. is yes. Not necessarily only for, for this application, I think, is what you're, yes, the answer is yes. Yes? Is there anything you can tell us about the uh, current interpretations of your data? Current inter interpretations of our data for OSTM? Yes. Um, nothing more than the fact that we're really trying to reproduce you know, our existing products. And, and so far in the test products, they're, even without calibration, we're producing almost equivalent products. So we expect to, to refine those products uh, even further after CalVal. <coughs> This maybe, yes, go ahead. I don't know. This <laughs> you can choose. I don't know who was that. From the uh, scientist's point of view on the uh, mission, was there anything that really sort of startled them? For OSTM? Yeah. I, 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 
OSTM were real. I think the startling point was how quickly we were able to get up in orbit and start producing data. I think within one month we were producing essentially usable data, although we're, not, we're not releasing it, is, is I think a, a good challenge for future missions. What, what is the long-term plan for this type of data collection? Because this is a three to five year mission. Correct. But to really evaluate global changes, you need to right. do these measurements for right. much longer than that. Yeah, so I mentioned, you know, it's not something, you know, in NASA's charter in particular to run operational long-term missions. So that's why we, we wanted to partner with NOAA and UMETSAT. So NOAA and UMETSAT are getting together right now and putting together a plan for incorporating this in the future, including a, a JSON-3, essentially, which is, which is starting, again, in the formulation right now. So I don't know if it'll, it'll happen, but uh, the, the science and, and the efforts are, are very strong to make that happen. Maybe in the back. Is, is your specialty also the uh, satellite positioning and, and any kind of wobbling um, to correct for those kinds of things? Yes. So uh, maybe. Just to be sure about what you mean by specialty, but the, the satellite positioning and attitude control and pointing and stability are, are key factors in being able to make that measurement. So we have fairly stringent requirements for those. I'm curious, can you just sort of explain more of in a general sense, when the satellite is over one part of the globe and the camera's pointing down, what is it that you do or what is it the satellite needs to do so that what's on the other side of the globe is not facing the stars? <laughs> so, you know, I kind of do this many times myself when I'm thinking about these kinds of things. So, I mean, we're, here's the Earth, we're, here's the altimeter pointing down, and essentially we're, we're just tracking it. So we're kind of pitching all the time around the Earth, and, and the spacecraft bus has uh, what we call reaction wheels, which are transferring momentum to, to continuously reorient the spacecraft so that it does stay nadir pointing, which is pointing towards the Earth all the time. And, and pointing very precisely that to it. Does that mean you use something like a gyroscope of some kind? So yeah, the spacecraft uses various elements, gyroscopes, uh, star cameras to, to find out what the spacecraft's attitude and position is. And then basically commands its actuators like wheels and magnetic torque bars to, to reorient the spacecraft. Yes, sir. In the yellow. Uh, what, what limits the lifetime of um, what limits, fuel is typically a, a limiting factor for us. Fuel is not a limiting factor uh, because we're in a, in a high orbit. But for us, the consequence of being in this particular orbit and this particular orientation is that we go through very high radiation belts. And you might have heard about these belts called the South Atlantic Anomaly over South America. And uh, we experience uh, a lot of high radiation effects and, and the design of the hardware uh, to make it radiation hard uh, is, is quite limiting, expensive, and uh, something that, that typically where we see some life limiting factors. So there are other things um, in terms of mechanisms uh, and so forth, but um, people typically talk about fuel and that's not such a big thing, but on my experience on these missions, radiation is a, is a big factor. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I don't know, this might be a silly question, but is there any correlation between what's happening with global warming and any astronomical changes in the planet? I have no clue. <laughs> I, think, I think I would be at a much higher level if I knew that. But <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, right now, we're, you're taking swaths of data. In order to get a complete picture of the level of the ocean, do you need to take a continuous map of all the oceans? You know, does it have to be several satellites? Does the whole surface okay. have to be covered at the same right. time? Right. So, so the answer is yes. Um, and there are other altimeter missions flying. Um, however, they're kind of add-on payloads, so they don't have the same accuracy precision that this particular mission has. So we like to have essentially a constellation of at least two altimeters flying all the time. Uh, one that's usually a, a lower or different altimeter that's in a different orbit than us, and we use this altimeter on these missions as our reference uh, all the time. But yeah, the answer is yes. There's a uh, semi constellation. There's at least two flying, and that the objective from a global uh, science community perspective is to keep two altimeters flying. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
Are there altimeters on any of the other space missions which are looking at other planets? Which They may not have water, but they've got stuff on the surface. I'm sure altimetry or radars obviously are used, so um, I, don't, I don't know exactly the applications on other missions. Deep space missions, I, I, don't, I really don't know. Yes, sir? What is your apogee and perigee in that orbit, just out of curiosity? It's a circular 1336-kilometer orbit, essentially circular. Did I warn you out? No. OK. <laughs> yes, sir? As I understand, we can tell the distance from Earth to the moon very accurately using those reflector cubes. Uh, Earth to the moon? That's what I understand. So um, I, as I understand it, if you're using a reflector cube also on the spacecraft, you can tell its distance from the Earth very accurately. Yes. Then why is the, uh, the accuracy of the measurement I thought I saw up there, was it plus or minus two centimeters? Correct, or? correct. Okay. Well, what that measurement that you're seeing at, plus, as, at two centimeters is the final measurement accuracy. There's a whole host of uh, terms in the error budget that contribute to the final error that we have. And the ranging measurement, which is the altimeter itself, is one. The, the radiometer is another. The actual positioning instruments have uh, a, a budget also, an error allocation. And the error allocation for the, for the positioning is roughly one centimeter. So when we start out, um, that is an area that, that causes you know, a significant contribution. But the laser part of it, it's typically not something that's globally available all the time to give us continuous measurements all the time. If we had a way to laze the spacecraft from every spot all the time and, and understand where our position is all the time in real time, we'd do it. Yes, sir. But the Earth isn't an exact globe. It bulges at the equator. So yes. does the altitude remain 1336? Yes, the altitude, altitude, yes, the altitude is. But yes, the, the topography obviously isn't. The, the uh, magnetic field obviously isn't. So those are all used in the processing. Okay, maybe I, I've got answered some of your questions. Thank you.